WikiLeaks, as the wiki part of the name implies, was originally envisaged by Assange as a place where anyone could post material anonymously. That material could then be read, commented upon, and in particular verified by others. However, it quickly moved away from this model of publication, partly because people are more used to consuming news passively and do not generally want to crowdsource production, and also due to the important nature of the material WikiLeaks was receiving. Assange was becoming concerned that matters of national importance were not being picked up by broader news media and given the importance and analysis they deserved. For example, he was particularly appalled by media indifference to stories of corruption in Kenya, despite the assassination of two human rights lawyers involved in investigating extrajudicial murders. As the volume of leaks increased, WikiLeaks quickly had to adapt and take on the role of editor itself or to share this role with mainstream media. This explains in part Assange's own personal transformation from being a conduit for whistleblowers to seeing himself as a journalist and editor. It also explains the need for WikiLeaks to experiment with a variety of associations with mainstream news organisations. These relationships have resulted in major changes to whistleblowing and media laws in a variety of jurisdictions, many of which have made it harder for journalists to rely upon whistleblowing sources. The relationship between journalist and whistleblower source is becoming more complex in the internet era. The release of documents by WikiLeaks commenced in December 2006 with the publication of a letter relating to the Islamic government of Somalia. This was followed in 2007 with the publication of the Guantanamo Bay Manual, which covered the treatment and management of de detainees, detailing matters of psychological torture and interrogation techniques. In January 2008, WikiLeaks published hundreds of documents relating to massive tax evasion facilitated through the Swiss bank Julius Barr. This publication provoked legal action from the bank, including a temporary injunction granted against WikiLeaks in a California court, as well as generating a huge amount of publicity for the nascent whistleblower site. The bank subsequently dropped further legal action when the injunction was lifted. 2008 also saw the publication of Scientology handbooks, American fraternity handbooks, Vice Presidential Candidate Sarah Palin's emails and the membership list of the British National Party. 2009 witnessed the publication of a number of reports and messages, including the pager messages from 9-11. Following a period offline in late 2009, when it was shut down by an injunction against Dynadot, who directed the WikiLeaks.org domain to the European servers of WikiLeaks, 2010 was to witness a series of major publications, including the video Collateral Murder. Unlike the rest of WikiLeaks releases to that time, Collateral Murder represented the first attempt by WikiLeaks to produce a major independent journalistic piece. This 17-minute video is an edited version of 39 minutes of footage filmed from the cockpit of a US Army Apache helicopter in Iraq. It shows a group of Iraqis talking with two Reuters employees, and then the helicopter opens fire on the group, killing several people, including the Reuters employees. An Iraqi man taking his children to school is also shot and killed when he stops to render assistance. The emotional and inflammatory nature of this video attracted a great deal of press and public attention and represented a new development for WikiLeaks as a content provider. The Afghanistan war logs were released in July 2010, with the Iraq war logs following in October 2010 and the US Embassy diplomatic cables in November. The Afghan war logs comprise the US military's own logs of combat between 2004 and 2009, detailing matters such as requisitions for equipment. The Iraqi logs detailed field reports from the Iraq conflict, including details of civilian casualties and reports of torture by the Iraqi military and police. These publications clearly attracted the ire of the US government, which felt that it was being targeted by WikiLeaks. Initially having disregarded the online platform, the publication of the embassy cables appears to have been the final straw in the tolerance of the US government, which commenced a multi-prong attack on WikiLeaks, Assange and others associated with the platform. In 2010, WikiLeaks activities were effectively brought to an abrupt halt by the actions known as the banking blockade. Amazon stopped hosting WikiLeaks on the 1st of December 2010, claiming that WikiLeaks was in breach of its, term, of its terms of service in a number of ways. 
particularly with respect to its rights to own or control hosted content. Ironically, WikiLeaks had been prompted to move to the Amazon cloud hosting service due to the large-scale denial-of-service attacks it had been experiencing from pro-government activists following the publication of the embassy cables. Encouraged by various US politicians, other businesses began to follow suit. Every DNS withdrew its service on the 2nd of December 2010, making it impossible to access the WikiLeaks website by redirecting its domain name. PayPal severed its payment facility for WikiLeaks donations on the 3rd of December 2010, stating PayPal has permanently restricted the account used by WikiLeaks due to a violation of the PayPal acceptable use policy, which states that our payment service cannot be used for any activities that encourage, promote, facilitate or instruct others to engage in illegal activity. We've notified the account holder of this action. This position was reviewed and reinforced in a statement from PayPal's General Counsel on 7 December 2010. Also on 7 December 2010, Visa and MasterCard stopped processing payments to WikiLeaks. MasterCard spokesperson told CNET, MasterCard rules prohibit customers from directly or indirectly engaging in or facilitating any action that is illegal. Visa Europe justified its suspension of service on the grounds that it was investigating whether WikiLeaks contravened any visa operating rules. The Bank of America discontinued its service to WikiLeaks on the 18th of December, stating that it was acting upon reasonable belief that WikiLeaks may be engaged in activities that are, amongst other things, inconsistent with our internal policies for processing payments. Apple removed the WikiLeaks app, not actually provided by WikiLeaks, from its App Store on the 20th of December 2010 on the grounds that the app violated the developer guidelines. Western Union placed WikiLeaks on its interdiction list on the 21st of December. WikiLeaks became effectively cut off from its key funding sources and was characterised as an outlaw institution. All of these actions were based on the service provider's claim that WikiLeaks had violated the terms of service, such as the PayPal example. WikiLeaks has stated that the banking blockade effectively starved it of income, 95% of its revenue costing it tens of millions of pounds, and this led in 2011 to WikiLeaks suspending its publishing operations. Whilst WikiLeaks was able to restore service and resist all of these attempts to characterise its platform as unlawful, the damage had been done. It took several months to restore the platform and continue its work. Despite this, WikiLeaks continues to function as a whistleblowing platform and news organisation. Like Anonymous, another entity we will discuss this week, WikiLeaks is a true creation of the internet. It challenges government and traditional media models alike, providing a platform for large-scale digital dissemination of leaks. Its underpinning philosophy is of openness and freedom of information, and yet Assange is also an advocate for personal privacy. In the next module, we'll consider how these concepts are reconciled in Assange's vision of the internet.